Hey everyone, my name is Blake Razor. I'm a grad student in Mike Jewett's group at Northwestern University, and I'm excited to talk to you today about the growing field of cell-free synthetic biology and some of the ways we're applying it both in the laboratory and in the classroom. It's increasingly evident that we're facing significant challenges around the world in terms of human health and environmental health. And the first that comes to mind, of course, is widespread infections, uh, like the pandemic we're living through, uh, as well as difficulty treating those infections, whether from rapidly evolving viruses or antibiotic resistance, and also from the unequal distribution of treatments for these diseases. Additionally, as industrialization has picked up, we've continually added pollutants into the air and water, which causes localized hazards for many populations. But as a biologist, when I look at cells, I see a lot of potential solutions to these problems. Cells are, are little factories that make molecules as diverse as antibodies and antibiotics, biofuels and RNA that's in the vaccines. And naturally they produce really small amounts of these compounds, but through synthetic biology techniques, we can engineer them to produce higher quantities of these useful molecules that we can then apply for human health and sustainability. The way we do this is through programming cells with DNA. So synthetic biology focuses on using this central dogma where DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins that will have some sort of function. Often these are enzymes that will convert one biochemical into another. And synthetic biology will, will use this central dogma either to increase the expression of proteins that are already in the cell to make products that they already make, like some antibiotics, or we can make an entirely new set of instructions. We can delete genes that we don't care about. We can add genes that will let the cell do something entirely new, like break down a waste product or produce useful chemicals and proteins. The problem with this though, is that we have to fight the cell. Cells have spent millions of years evolving to put all of their carbon and energy toward growth and reproduction, but synthetic biologists, biological engineers want these cells to focus on just a couple of molecules that probably aren't doing much for the cell. So to get around this, we break the tug of war by using cell-free systems. In the Jewett lab, what we do is we grow a lot of E. coli, we'll break the cells open and harvest all of the, the, the components that were within the cell, all that biological machinery that can be useful to us. Then we can add DNA, add those instructions into the extract, which enables cell-free protein synthesis. Then we can mix those proteins together with some sugar and uh, other cofactors, which enables the production of different chemical products. This cell-free system is really useful in a few key ways. The first is that we've, we've gotten rid of the living cell. So we no longer have to fight for energy and carbon. The cell isn't trying to reproduce anymore. And now we have an open reaction environment. We don't have to worry about the cell wall being a barrier and we can focus on producing a high concentration of a protein or a chemical that might be toxic in a living system. Additionally, because this came from a cell, all of the native biological machinery is still there. So if the full central dogma is there that we can convert those DNA instructions into useful proteins. And there's also metabolism that can break down things like sugar and convert it into biological precursors. And finally, we can add and delete genes or enzymes without having to worry about cell survival. The key technology in cell-free synthetic biology is called cell-free protein synthesis. And this is the process where we take cell extracts, mix it with a few chemicals, primarily an energy source, instructions in the form of DNA, some amino acids, and then other ingredients just to keep everything working together well. We stick it in an incubator or even leave it at room temperature. And biology does its thing. The central dogma proceeds, converts that DNA to RNA into protein. And if our DNA instructions are for something easy to see, like a green fluorescent protein, that's visible within just a couple of hours. And this technology lets us do a lot of different things just by changing out the DNA. So I'm going to walk through a few of the key applications that cell-free synthetic biologists use, and particularly that we're working on in the Jewett lab. What I primarily focus on is cell-free metabolism. So again, I take cell extracts, I add some DNA, and these, uh, these plasmids encode different enzymes. Then I can mix those enzymes together, in this case, for the butanol biosynthesis pathway, making a biofuel. 
and uh, and these enzymes will work together with central metabolism to make the product that I care about. And I can change the enzymes just by changing the DNA, which is fast and easy. And again, I'm mixing it with this cell extract that contains all of the native enzymes in E. coli that can break down glucose into the, the common precursor acetyl-CoA. And then the enzymes that I've produced separately can then convert that acetyl-CoA into the biofuel that E. coli normally doesn't make. And by swapping out those, those DNA molecules, those instructions to make different enzymes, we can make a wide variety of chemicals, whether that's a biofuel, a solvent, industrial plastics, or even uh, pharmaceutical precursors, which provides a sustainable route as an alternative to petrochemical synthesis that makes most of these products in our daily life. In addition to producing chemicals, these cell-free reactions can also sense chemicals. And this relies on transcription factors, which are biological sensing mechanisms that have evolved for cells to be able to detect things in their environment and respond to them. Normally what happens is that a transcription factor, the sensor protein will prevent transcription. Uh, so the DNA can't be converted into RNA or protein, but in the presence of a trigger molecule, that will bind or interact with the transcription factor, then transcription can proceed and you'll have some type of output. And this is really useful because cells have evolved in all sorts of different environments, which means existing transcription factors have evolved to sense a wide variety of molecules that include things that we might care about in water sources, particularly. Things like antibiotics, small molecules that are toxic and heavy metals like lead. And the, the beauty of the cell-free system is that you can just add the sample that you want to detect, something like drinking water or lake water. And after a few minutes or up to an hour, the amount of the toxin you're trying to sense will determine how fast you get a signal and how bright that signal is. So it's sort of like a pH strip or a pregnancy test where you've got both the, the yes or no aspect of a contaminant but also a concentration dependence where a high concentration of lead is going to lead to a much brighter signal of whatever fluorescent protein or colorimetric indicator you have as the output downstream of that transcription factor. In a totally different type of application, more focused on human health, we can use cell-free systems to make therapeutics. This relies in part on the production of sugar groups and sugars are really important to the function and stability of certain immune, uh, certain proteins and the way they interact with the immune system. And this is similar to the cell-free metabolism I talked about a few slides ago, where we have different enzymes that produce and group these sugar molecules and other enzymes that will then attach them to the protein of interest. So we use the cell-free system to make all these enzymes, synthesize those sugar groups, synthesize the protein we wanna decorate, and then combine them together so that we have a sugar-coated protein. One of the best examples of this is antibodies. Uh, so antibodies are the big Y-shaped structure in the middle. They're often decorated with sugar groups on the sides. And these sugar groups allow the antibody to be much more stable in our bloodstream, allows them to last longer and provide a more effective defense against whatever they're trying to bind, uh, whether that be a virus or a uh, bacteria. Additionally, we can use this sugar decoration technology to make vaccines more effective. So some vaccines are just based on a protein subunit. And if you add a sugar group onto that, then the immune system will have two molecules to recognize at once and it'll increase the specificity and the effectiveness of the immune system at targeting uh, bi uh, biological contaminants that have these proteins, uh, particularly bacteria. The limitation here, though, if we wanted to sense or produce vaccines anywhere other than the laboratory, is that these reactions are really sensitive to temperature. So even though we can control all the components, we have a lot of flexibility with this, we have to store our cell extracts at negative 80 degrees. And this cold chain storage is, is the same issue we ran into with vaccine distribution last year. But we can get around this in our case by pulling all of the water out. So we can freeze dry our cell-free reactions, get all of the water out, which leaves us with this powdery 
protein pellet at the bottom of a tube and we can send it anywhere in the world at room temperature where it will remain stable until we add water and DNA to activate that biological machinery and produce things like sensors and vaccines right where they're needed. This is a really exciting application. And as people were, were developing this a couple of years ago and optimizing the freeze dried component, they also realized that this would be really useful in a classroom. So the same idea of, of dehydrating the reaction, we can send it to schools all around the country. And then by adding DNA instructions for things like fluorescent proteins, we have a really easy colored readout that will show the central dogma in progress without the need to grow any cells, which means you don't have to have an incubator. You don't have to worry about biosafety protocols. And this is a cheap and, and relatively easy way to show a lot of different biological processes simply by changing the DNA. So you can cover things like the central dogma, how enzymes work, and even advanced concepts like CRISPR-based gene editing in a way that's, that's really user-friendly. The just add water aspects makes this much more accessible than, than similar entry-level chemistry experiments. And our lab is continuing to develop this. We're hoping to make this more accessible and drive the cost down even further. And right now there are commercial kits available through a company called Mini PCR. And they sell these two kits, one focusing on the central dogma, the conversion of DNA to RNA to protein, and another more advanced kit looking at the relationship between a protein structure and how that impacts the function. And as our lab continues to push forward applications of cell-free synthetic biology to apply them both to human health and sustainability, we hope to also simultaneously reach more students by making more advanced educational modules, bringing this cutting edge science right into the classroom so that we can help expand the workforce and, and bring more people into the growing field of synthetic biology. So that was a really quick overview of some of the things we're working on in the Jute Lab and, and some of the general uh, focuses of cell-free synthetic biology as a field. I wanna thank everyone in the Jute Lab whose work I shared in part. And you can find more information on our website, jewettlab.northwestern.edu. I also wanna highlight a few members of the synthetic, uh, Center for Synthetic Biology at Northwestern. Uh, Julius Neha and Danielle are also very interested in STEM education and outreach and are pushing forward different initiatives, um, some in partnership with us and, and some on their own to, to reach students and develop the professional workforce at different levels. And finally, I want to thank the Baxter Center for helping connect us with different schools, different teachers in the Chicago area and making this outreach possible.